glory, risen, conquering Son, endless is the victory, thou, O death, hast won, and no more we doubt of thee, glorious Prince of life. Life is not without thee, aid us in our strife. What he's done for us. We still have the freedom to serve him. And uh, we're thankful, thankful to be able to do that this morning. And uh, uh, there's a verse in 1 Thessalonians that uh, that would make us think about being thankful. There's in everything we give thanks. This is the will of God. It's the will of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord, <clears throat> to, to in everything give thanks. And I've written in my Bible, beside that verse, in everything, not for everything. <laughs> but you know, really, in everything, really, it means for everything. You can't get away from it. Uh, it's a, uh, we should be thankful for all the things that we have happened to our lives. So no matter what happened to you, God is good. And, uh, and he's faithful and he's true. And you can trust him. And, um, I was thinking about that verse actually a week ago. I was laying in bed before I, just before I would get up and talking to the Lord. And I was thinking, have I ever been thankful for everything and, and in everything? Now, in everything is actually more difficult than for everything. Or being thankful for everything is very difficult. But to be actually thankful for it while you're in it, mm -hmm. that's really hard. While you're <clears throat> in the things that we have to go through. Now, things we will thank, be thankful for today and Monday, we'll, we'll name off all the happy things, all the good things. Yet we're responsible for, for so many other things. And, uh, I don't know if, if you're like this or not, but when I get time to think, almost always the devil will remind me of all the things I've done wrong. Mm -hmm. and so uh, uh, I think he's the accuser of the brother, not just before the throne of God, but also in our lives, in our hearts. He's the accuser of the brother. And uh, all the things that the Lord has forgiven me. I often remember them over and over, and I can remember stuff all the way back to my childhood, long before I was saved. And the devil likes to bother me about. And so, anyway, I was laying in bed to try thinking back over the wreckage of my life, of which the Lord has forgiven uh, the things that I've done, and I'm greatly appreciative of that. But, uh, and I had a tear, actually, I'm not one to cry, but I had a tear and, uh, or two as I was thinking back and being thankful for all the things that the Lord has allowed to happen in my life over the years. And uh, 40 years in the ministry, you, uh, you say things from time to time you shouldn't have said and do things that you probably shouldn't have done, and, and uh, as all of us do, and that we want to be thankful. So let's begin this morning with being thankful. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to be gathered in your name this morning. Thank you for each one who's who's interested and able to come. Pray, Father, that you might deal with us and bless us in this time and speak to our hearts. And uh, let not our hearts be hard. Let not our necks be stiff. May you find us willing, Lord, to, to follow you and to serve you. May you bless in this time we might come close to you, Lord. And we have much to thankful for, be thankful for this morning. And we thank you for good things, and we thank you for difficult things, and uh, for hard th hardships and, and uh, hard times, even times that we're responsible for making hard. Uh, still, we thank you, Lord, that you have been faithful to us and have loved us with an everlasting love. Thank you for your love for us this morning. And now work in our hearts. I can't do anything, and yet, Lord, we look to you and say, can you do something with us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, if you take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 9, please. 
pastor asked me yesterday, yesterday afternoon, and so uh, I didn't really have a Thanksgiving message ready, so I wasn't planning on preaching, so uh, I don't really have a Thanksgiving per se message, but a message from the Word of God anyway, and uh, I trust that the Lord will bless that and use it. Now to forgive me, I've already been preaching for 45 minutes. My uh, voice is a little dry. <clears throat> and uh, like some of you say, let's hope the sermon isn't dry. Ma Mark chapter uh, 9 in your Bible. I still haven't found it. Apparently I went to the wrong place first. Appreciate so much the opportunity to be with you, by the way. It's a blessing to be with you this morning. And uh, <clears throat> thank the Lord that I can be with you and that you are here. Mark chapter 9, if you want to <clears throat> look at verse 14. Verse 14 is going to pick up here really right, right where the, the Lord is up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He's going to show his glory to Peter, James, and John. Again, they're the only ones that get to to be there for this very special moment. So the rest of the disciples are down at the bottom of the mountain. And while they're down at the bottom of the mountain, this is what's happening when Jesus isn't there. And when they came to his disciples, Mark 9, 14, he saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, what question ye with them? And if you look down to verse 19, he answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. In, the, in Matthew, I believe it's worded, O faithless and perverse generation. The Lord says uh, to these people, faithless here actually means without saving faith in Jesus Christ. And of course, uh, He's referring to someone in this crowd as being without, the, without saving faith. And the word perverse, the word perverse here has the idea of uh, getting in God's way. In other words, doing something or, or trying to do something to restrict the plan of God of saving souls, of the, the plan of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you said that's not a saved person he's talking to. Many people wonder, what is this verse 19 addressed to? Who is the Lord calling faithless and, and Matthew also perverse? Well, there's, there's a, if you look up in commentaries, you get, a, you get a whole bunch of things that people say. They'll say, oh, it's the Father. Well, I don't think it was the Father. They'll say it was the crowd. I don't think it was the crowd. Uh, uh, they, uh, they have different people they think it is. Uh, but... Uh, You'll notice here in verse 14, it says uh, right here that they saw the scribes questioning with them. I think it was the scribes. Now, the scribes have had a problem uh, ever since the ministry of John the Baptist. There was a man, John, the gospel says, sent from God. There's a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for a witness, to bear witness of that light that all men through him might believe. And so the the whole point of John's ministry was so that everybody would believe, so that everybody would put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there were some people who refused to do that. If you just go, go over to Matthew 3, we'll come back here. Uh, I want to look at Matthew 3 for a moment. If you're in the habit of following me in the Bible, it's kind of a good thing to do. If not, you're taking notes, that's fine. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, it says, uh, In those days... Verse 1, came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And everybody who enters into the kingdom of heaven needs to repent. Every one of us needs to change our mind about the Lord Jesus, about ourselves, about where our sin is taking us. Uh, we, we need to repent. And, and so John is preaching repentance and for those to put faith in the one who's coming after him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse uh, 3, for this is he that was spoken of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And, and then if you go down in verse 7, it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, 
O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? O generation of vipers. Who's he talking to? I don't think he's talking to the whole crowd. His Bible says, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, if I'm too loud, don't be afraid to turn me down. If there's some part of me you're not going to be able to turn down. So, if you have some, you can. Uh, you might want to do that. But when he saw, now in the Bible, when you see Pharisees, and many times in the Bible you'll see it put this way, scribes and Pharisees. They always seem to be together. The scribes and Pharisees uh, hobnobbing together. But uh, here they come to the baptism of John. Now watch what John says to them. He says, he says, O generation of vipers. Now a viper was the poisonous snake. The most poisonous. As a matter of fact, when, when a viper bit you, within, a, within only a few moments you'd fall down dead. Depending, I suppose, where you were bitten. But, uh, uh, you know, when Paul, Apostle Paul was shipwrecked, he was putting a bundle of sticks in the fire, and a viper came out. They thought he would fall down dead immediately. And when he didn't, they decided he was something other than a criminal. But uh, uh, he called, here's what John is calls this, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, a generation of snakes. Poisonous snakes is all you're dangerous, he said. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, he said, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Do you know what he's saying? He's saying you didn't come here to flee from the wrath to come. You should have, but you didn't. You didn't come here to get right with God. You didn't. Why do we come to church this morning? You know, maybe, oh, it's Thanksgiving, we'll go to church. Or, or you know, church is what we do, but uh, I hope we came to hear from the Lord. That's what I came for. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, but, but these were hypocritical people. They were fake. They pretended to, to, uh, to serve the Lord. They didn't serve Him. Uh, and watch what He says. He says, in verse 8, bring forth, therefore, fruits for repentance. In other words, if you've come to repent, prove it. Prove, <clears throat> prove it. This would be something different with your life. And think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham to our father. For I send you that God is able to these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And I've not been to the Holy Land. Apparently, you don't have to be anywhere. And you can look down, there's stones there. And, and John's out in the wilderness preaching in the... In the land that wasn't uh, agricultural land, there was probably lots of stones. He said, don't you think that just because you're of the lineage, uh, you're of the family of Abraham, that you're going to heaven? He said, God could, if it was just, it was just descendants of Abraham, he could raise up descendants of Abraham out of these stones that are here. Uh -huh. That's not it. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then he says in verse 10, and now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Uh, therefore, every good, every, every tree rather which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast in the fire. Now from the farm, I understand. <clears throat> but the farmer comes out and takes the axe and lays it up against one of the big roots of a tree and leaves it there. If I was the tree, I'd look down and see that axe there and say, "Whoa, whoa, ho, 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 there's an axe." You know, I know what that can be used for. John is telling these people they need to. They need to get right with God. They need to do business with God. There's a whole lot of, of us saying, you know, I will make things right with the Lord later. Some other time, I'll be the Christian that I always knew that I should have been. Listen to me. The devil is a liar. That time will never come. If you keep saying that I'll do that later, later I'll make things right with someone I offended, uh, later I'll repent of my sins, later I'll deal with a secret thing in my life that's interfering between me and God, you're not going to do it. You always say you're going to do it later. You always say that sometime later I'll get right with the Lord and all our putting things off. Uh, the devil's laughing. And, but that's not the way God does things. He says today is the day of salvation. There is not another time. You are not promised another day. You might not live another day. You might not live through this afternoon. The only moment we have is this moment. The only day we have is this day. Today is the day to walk with God. Today is the day to get the Bible out and, and read it and not say, I'm going to read the Bible. I'll spend more time with the Lord someday. Someday I'll spend time in prayer. I was in the hospital with my heart. And they weren't letting me out. <laughs> Matter of fact, they kept 
they kept always putting it off another day. You know, oh, you'll probably go home tomorrow, or you'll probably get your the rest of your surgery tomorrow, and, then, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, and it went on to about two weeks. Finally, I was, you know, I'm stupid, but finally I can clue in. And I said, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? You're telling me something. And I had been neglecting to pray as much as I should have. I still spent time with the Lord, but not like I should have. Not, not the time that I, that I intended to. And so here's, a, here's an interesting thing. The surgery that they never seemed to be able to, to schedule. As soon as I said to the Lord, all right, I know I'm here. And I started to spend my day praying. It's funny, the surgery was scheduled immediately after that. And the day after that, I went home. I said to my wife, I said, if I hadn't listened to the Lord, I'd probably still be in the hospital now. And that horrible food. But anyway, <laughs> you know, heart patient won't give you any salt. And I live on salt, so <clears throat> that was hard for me. Now is the axe. Listen, while driving this morning to church, I sat at a light and I watched the crosswalk countdown. And I thought, everyone, not just me, every one of our lives is counting down. Mm -hmm. It's counting down. We always figure there's more time, there's more time. Listen, that is not how God wants us to look at our lives. He wants you and I to look at this moment. What would we, how would we serve God in this moment and, and live for Him? And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we're the only ones that can answer that. I, I was speaking to a friend of mine about, about this very subject not long ago, and he said, he's, he took it personally. Amen. That's what we're supposed to do with the things of God. And they said, now what should I do? I said, well, I don't know, but you should know uh, what you should do. We, we have fun how we know. And uh, we know what, we, what needs to be done in our lives. Now the axe is laid under the root of the trees. He says, every tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit is going to be hewn down. You know, if you were a scribe standing there, you'd think you'd get that. And, and uh, but John goes on, and he says, uh, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And if you look, in, if you look up uh, into what other people say about this verse, a lot of people don't know what this fire is, and what, the, you know, what is the Holy Ghost and what is fire. Well, it's in the very next verse. At the end of the next verse, it says, he'll burn up with the chaff with unquenchable fire. Where is there unquenchable fire? In hell. What is he saying? Either you can be immersed in the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost in you, or uh, what you have when you get saved, or you can have fire that never goes out. When the Lord Jesus come, comes, he says, you're going to get one or the other. You're going to either get saved, or, or there's judgment coming. And in verse 12, he says, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. His fan is in his hand. Jesus hasn't, had, you know, his public ministry hasn't really even just started. Uh, and uh, not until the baptism of John. And he, here's John saying, his fan is in, in his hand. And what in the world does that mean? Well, if you're from the farm, you know. You know, since the, since, since wheat grew and man was on this earth, uh, the way to harvest it was to pick the heads off, put it on a floor, beat it, and hopefully there was some wind blowing. And it was a good day to thresh wheat. When wind was blowing, you beat it uh, uh, with a threshing tool, and the wind would blow. And then the chaff, which is that outer husk, when, it, when, the, when the wheat is in the head, there's a protective husk around it. That's the chaff. So you've got to separate it from the chaff. You don't want to eat the chaff. Uh, and so the wind would blow. But when, when the wind didn't blow, you know what they did? They got a fan. In those days, you know, not, 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 not a torcan fan, you might think of it. You know, a, just a, a fan like a lady might use in a church that's too hot. But the Lord has his fan. He said the fan is already in his hand. Now think about that. The axe, he said, is already laid against the root. What's it waiting for? The fan's already in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor. He said, he'll gather the wheat into the garner, us into heaven. 
but the chaff's going to be burned up with unquenchable fire. I don't know if the scribes got it, but it was a plain sermon about them and what was wrong with their lives. And uh, we need to, you know, we need to realize this is the Lord. He's always ready. The fan's already in his hand. Uh, he's ready. And anyway, uh, I just wanted to say those things about the scribes because when I go back here to Mark's gospel in Mark 9 uh, and verse 14, the Lord comes down from them from the mountain. And, and when they when he comes down from the mountain, the scribes are questioning. You know, I like that. Scribes are kind of questioning. You know, you know, the word questioning means to make an inquiry. They're making a formal inquiry. They're making a big deal out of the fact that these disciples could not cast out this child with the devil. You know, think about it. They're not saved. They've never been able to do anything for God and have really in their hearts no use for him, even though they pretend to. They have never been able to do anything, and they're going to now inquire, why, the, why couldn't you do anything? You know, oh, God, God loved that. But our Lord came down from the mountain, and the first thing he says, uh, uh, he says in verse 16, what question ye with them? You know what? The Lord comes down, and the first thing he's going to do is he's going to take on those scribes. He's going to take them to task for, for them and their inquiry about why Jesus' disciples fit. I love this because when I sin and when I fail, Jesus is still on my side. He's still representing me. He's still standing up for me even when I don't stand up for him. <clears throat> the Lord is on our side. And, uh, and so he, he's, uh, he's going to take care of what's going on here. But the, the scribes never get to answer because the father pipes up and he says, uh, here, and he says, uh, one of the multitude answered and said, uh, <clears throat> it wasn't a scribe, Master, I brought unto thee my son, which had a dumb spirit. Uh, and, which means that when the demon was, as soon as the demon took this child over, the child could never speak again. And, uh, and, uh, and he says, uh, in verse 18, he says, And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth, and, and he foameth, and, and, and gnashes with his teeth, and pineth away. In other words, he gets, he's thin and haggard uh, and emancipated. From, he, he's just, he's, just uh, he's, he's malnourished from, from this, this devil that has it. And he said, And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. And I don't think he was accusing. I think he was just stating the Lord, This is what happened, Lord. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the way we need to be. We've got problems, tell it all to the Lord. You know, it's funny. When people recount things, they will generally tell what happened except what was their fault. <laughs> right? We're like that. We'll tell if somebody else was to blame in this as well as us. Yes, who's to blame when we tell the story? We don't say anything about us, but we might say something about somebody else. You know, when you're going to deal with the Lord, don't do that. Start with yourself. And uh, start with what's wrong with you. And uh, uh, you'll be so busy with that, you won't really have time to worry about other people's sins. Uh, spend time about ourselves. But uh, uh, he tells the Lord all about it, and, and he just says, you know, they couldn't cast him out. And that's when he says, verse 19, uh, oh, faithless generation. Oh, who is it with no saving faith? Well, in particular, it's the scribes. Then he says, how long shall I be with you? I'm not going to be here very long. The Lord's ministry only three, three years or so. And how long shall I suffer you? The word suffer there means to endure. Someone who's hard to put up with. That's what the Lord is saying. It's hard to put up with you people who have no faith. And he says, how long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and fell on the ground wallowing, and wallowed foam, and he asked the father, how long ago is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. We well, opened a wound when he said that. And... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, sometimes the Lord speaks or deals with us in a way that, that opens a wound. And, uh, uh, he, uh, 
And the, the father brings it out. He says, uh, of a child, he says. And then verse 22, his explanation. And oft time, yet the devil cast him into the fire and into the water. Do you know what that must have been like, raising a child like that? Now he's probably a young man. Maybe he's an older teenager, maybe in his 20s. So we're not told how old he is. Uh, and uh, he just calls him his child still, uh, as you always would. But uh, imagine a child, you know, there's a fire burn, he jumps in the fire. And you have to drag him out before he's burned in the fire. And he, if he's near water, he jumps in the water, uh, starts drowning, you have to jump in there and get him as fast as you can. How difficult, it's hard enough, children seem to, little children seem to be on a collision course with uh, trying to end their life anyway. Uh, you, you, you try to keep a, a young child alive, but uh, this one, uh, this one was really hard. And all of the torture that was to these parents. And so he says in verse 22, if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us, and help us. That sounds good, right? Not really. He says to the Lord, he says, if you can do anything, you know, even if you can just improve the situation, just anything that would, ha would help at all. If you can do anything, and please care about us, have compassion on us, and, and help us. Do you know what Jesus says? Because that's not good enough. He said, Jesus said to him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. The word believeth there means to put your confidence in the Lord Jesus. To put your faith, your trust in the Lord Jesus. The Lord says, if you could believe, if you could have faith, he said, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now watch. The father was willing to trust the Lord far enough to say, you know, if you could do anything. Maybe you could do something. Nobody else could do anything. If you can just do anything. But that's not much of a faith. The Lord says to him, all things are possible to him that believeth. Here's where, you, here's where you are. Here's where you need to go. He's so kind about it, though. And the Bible says that about the Lord. A bruised reed shall he not break. Uh, he is so kind with this father. The father's already really broken hearted over what he's had to suffer all these years with this child. He wants his child to be healed. And, and, uh, and, uh, and the Bible says here, if you look at verse 24, it says, And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. You know, I was doing some thinking the other day. Is it a sin to not have faith in the Lord. And I, as I was thinking about that, I was, I was thinking what the Bible says in Hebrews eleven six that well, faith is impossible to please God. For he that come with him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It's impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith has to be with everything. Faith has to be with us, with us giving to the Lord at church. Faith has to be with us singing. Uh, that what we sing, we believe what we're singing, we're not just singing the words. <clears throat> but faith has to be with everything, with every willingness to follow Him, with every willingness to serve Him. Uh, faith. Exercise faith. Trust the Lord in difficult circumstances. And uh, Romans 14 says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. He's talking about questionable things. He mean on the offered on idols. So if you got saved out of idolatry and you were you would have believed your whole life that when that meat was offered to that idol, that was fellowship with the idol, and then you got saved and you know that that's all wrong, and the, and the, yet someone brings the meat they bought at the market cheap and they, they're going to set it in front of you and, and you're going to eat it. But you think that if you eat that, that's the same as having fellowship with the idol still, because that's what you came out of. The Bible says that's sin. If you can't do what you do with an absolute trust in God, it is an evil thing to do. It's sin. It is, you know, in the Lord's ministry, you know, the Lord can do anything, but over and over and over, He required faith. Believest thou that I'm able to do this? 
according to your faith, be it unto you. Thy faith hath saved thee. And on and on and on throughout the New Testament, the Lord says, faith was important. <clears throat> faith is important in all those miracles. And, uh, and so faith is important here. And, uh, and, and the Lord says, it's not if I can do anything. That's not what it is. It's not a question. You know, can I do anything? It's if you can believe. And the father recognized what is wrong. What was wrong in his life. Now here's the thing. With us, a lot of times, our faith has a bit of doubt with it. It's just, it's difficult for us. It's difficult for our old hearts sometimes to really have an absolute faith in God. As a matter of fact, the Lord, the Lord said about a centurion whose, whose servant was sick that, you know, he said, you know, I'll come and heal him. And, Jesus, and, the, and the man said, no. He said, I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof, but speak the word only, and he'll be healed. And he understood, being a Gentile even, he understood that he was talking, he was talking to Jehovah God. And the Lord, and the, and the Lord basically said to him, he said, you know, you know, according to your faith, be it unto you. I forget his exact words, I can look the passage up. But uh, but he explained the insurance explained it this way. He said, I'm a man under authority, and I have soldiers under me. So he had to do what he was told. He said, I say to my servant, do this and do it. I say to, to, to a soldier, go there, and he goeth, and, and, and do this, and he doeth. And wh whatever I say, it gets done. And he said, speak the word only. You know, most people couldn't believe that Jesus could heal across miles. Mm. You know, Martha said to him when he came to, after Lazarus died, she said, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. She didn't realize that if the Lord wanted him to be healed, he could have healed him where he was. He didn't have to come. But the centurion had this faith. And so the Lord said about this centurion, he said, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Not, even, not anywhere in Israel among his own people had he seen the faith that, that that centurion had. Faith is so important to the Lord. And so can the Lord help us with our faith? Well, he can. This man was wise and he knew how to do it. He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Guess who can always help us with our faith? Uh, always the Lord can help us to, to, uh, to grow and, and, and to walk in faith and, uh, and, and to be close to him. And uh, this father... Uh, what was uh, was blessed by the Lord and what, what the Lord was doing there. And uh, uh, we want to walk with him. We want to be close to him. And, uh, uh, and he healed, it. He healed that, that child. Uh, it says in verse 25, When Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, enter no more into him. And the, and the spirit cried and rent him sore, and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, he's dead. I know who said he was dead. He's dead. <laughs> the scribes probably said that. You know, they're in the background saying, Jesus, the disciples couldn't heal. Now watch. Jesus couldn't heal him. He just killed him. There he is laying there motionless on the ground. He's dead. And they were probably rubbing their hands with glee. And you know, I think the child was there relaxing, or the young man, which he probably is now, was there just relaxing on the ground. He'd had a devil in him all those years, tormenting him and, and twisting up his insides and hurting him. And for the first time in all those years, he was free. He just laid there motionless. And the Bible says Jesus came and reached down his hand and lifted him up. What a wonderful thing it is when Jesus reaches down his hand to you and I, I was lost in my sins. I was working on the farm. I was going to die and go to hell. And Jesus reached down his hand. I was riding the Alice Chalmers tractor. And the Spirit of God spoke to me as, and convicted me on that day. And the Lord reached down his hand as I knelt underneath an old hickory tree. And asked Jesus to forgive my sins and save my soul. And I said, Lord, do it right now. 
And, and, uh, and that's about all the faith I had. Just do it right now and save me and take my sins away. And he did. And the Lord reached down and he lifted me up. I knelt down wicked and vile and filthy and on my way to hell. And he reached down his hand and lifted me up. And when I got up my knees, I was a saved soul. I was a child of God. My name was written in the Lamb's book of life. And heaven was my home. Amen. It's wonderful to be here. And the Lord reaches down his hand to us. And, and uh, he reaches to us still this morning to help us. What are you doing? Are you, you're struggling with doubt or you're struggling with difficult things. Uh, the Lord is there uh, to help us and, and to, to care about you and to care about what you're going through in your life. And uh, other people may not know what it is, uh, but, uh, but the Lord is there and, and uh, He cares about you. And, and He cares about uh, that you walk with Him, that you be close to Him, uh, that you be in, encouraged. And the, the Lord loves us so much and, and cares about us. And uh, I, want to, uh, I want to go to just one other place. Very quickly, Matthew chapter 6 in the Bible, Matthew chapter 6. There are four times in the New Testament where Jesus said to, to his disciples, I believe every time, the four times he said, O ye of little faith. I think that's our, obviously, that's that's us. O ye of little faith. I, I, I don't want to be that, but, but that's what we often are. <clears throat> Uh, we often just have a little bit of faith, and and uh, and, uh, and not what we should should have. Actually, that's not the scripture I wanted. Uh, <clears throat> it's Mark, Mark chapter four. My apologies. My notes were a bit of a mess here this morning. Mark chapter 4. I don't know about you, but sometimes I can't read my own writing even. So, uh, I, uh, it's not very good. Mark 4 and verse 35. In the same day when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. By the way, how, even as he was, how was he? He was tired. He had been <clears throat> preaching, preaching and, and speaking to people, dealing with people all day, healing people. He was tired. They took him as he was into the ship. Verse 37. And there rose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and they said to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? We see the Lord and the disciples across and crossing. And a great, the great, a great storm comes up. He's in the back part of the boat, the hinder part of the boat, asleep on a pillow. <laughs> He's asleep. You know, the Lord never sleeps. The Bible says the Lord never sleeps. The man is sleeping, but the Lord is not asleep. And uh, the great storm comes up. Guess who made the storm come up? He's sleeping in the back of the boat. I don't know a lot about, storm, about boat, boats. I'm a farmer. Uh, but uh, uh, I know there's a, something called a water line usually on a boat. And you're not supposed to load a boat so that, that line's below the edge of the water or it will sink. So here they are in the boat, and the Bible says that, the, that, that, that these great waves were coming over the side of the boat. Uh, uh, the, the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. Now the disciples are alarmed about the storm, but then the waves keep coming. Well, guess who's putting the water in the ship? He's sleeping in the back of the boat. He's, there he is taking his hand, taking water, and filling her up. <laughs> He's filling her up, and they're getting more and more terrified as the, day, as the moments go. One more wave comes over. She's going down. They go to the back of the boat. They wake the Lord. They grab him in terror. 
And they said, carest thou not that we perish? Don't you care that we're going to die out here? <coughs> you know, you can't explain why God does the things he does sometimes. You can't explain it. You say, well, why, why in the world? Why did this happen to me? Or maybe you're saying, you know, I was praying for good weather today. Why is it bad weather when I ask the Lord for good weather? I had a service van, a road mechanic, and so I had a, I had a service van, and it was almost brand new. And uh, so I asked the Lord that I would never run into anything with it, never be in an accident with it uh, at any time. One of the friends at work wanted to borrow my MIG welder, which I had in my van, and so uh, I jumped in my van and backed up without looking in the right mirror, like the dumber that I am. And... Uh, and the roll-off was parked there, and you know the roll-off truck's got that knife edge on the bottom. I backed the van right into that, right in the corner of the van. A big, a big old dent in the van. And I said, Lord, I asked you that I would never be in an accident. You knew I was going to do that. I asked you to protect me, and, and you know, that I wouldn't have the embarrassment work going in, you know, back the van into the other vehicle, and how stupid can you be, <clears throat> sort of thing. And, and uh, I said, Lord, why did you do that? You know, sometimes the Lord's going to do things that are going to offend you. You're going to say, that don't seem right. Why would this happen to me when I've surrendered my whole life to serve the Lord? Why would this happen? There are going to be times in your life that are going to be difficult for you to have faith. And the disciples were having one out in that boat that day. As the thing was nearly <clears throat> going to shit, sink. And they came and awoke them. And, uh, and he said, peace, be still under the sea. And that was the end of that. The wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You know, I want you to notice the wording of the Bible. It's very important. He didn't say, why are you fearful? Because there are lots of times we're fearful, but we still believe in the Lord. Again, you know, we seem to have a, a faith mixed with doubt. But he says, why are you so fearful? Why are you so fearful? Well, that's a good question. <clears throat> How is it that you have no faith? No faith in that particular instance. Not that they had no faith in their lives. Not that they weren't trusting the Lord as their Savior. But in that particular instance, they were caught with no faith. Because they didn't understand. And there will be a lot of things that you don't understand in life. And uh, if, you have, if you could say... Well, you know, I've seen life go the way I thought it would go, and everything worked out the way I thought it would. Then you're you're the person I've never met yet. Because it doesn't matter who you are. We'll have regrets, and we'll have disappointments, and we'll have our own struggles, and we'll have our own struggles that the Lord has planned in our lives. But let me tell you something: He's never anything but good. He's never anything but wonderful. He's never anything but faithful. He's never anything but kind. And there'll be times when our faith will be stretched, or maybe in some circumstance we might not have no faith at all. But what's going on? We need to trust the Lord. And so it says, And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? I'll tell you what manner of man not just a man, God in human flesh. And the nice thing about something like this is you've been there. Once you learn your lesson, thankfully you don't have to have it over and over. And that's the way we want. We don't want to be struggling with the same sins today you were struggling with when you were 18. You want to, you want to have a victory over those and now you've got all the other things to deal with. And then Press on the upward way, the songwriter says. New heights I'm gaining every day. Well, I can't honestly say I'm gaining new heights every day. But <clears throat> thankfully, you know, let's, let's make some progress in serving God. Right. Let's not be like the scribes who had no use for what Jesus was saying or, or John the Baptist either. <clears throat> but, but let's have some faith in the Lord. Let's walk with him and, and, uh, and put our faith to use in, in serving him in this world. May God bless and help you today. Thank you, Father, for the word of God. Make it work in our hearts. 
that we went, we might have faith. When we struggle, that we'd be wise and say, Lord, help my unbelief. That we would recognize you for who you are, Lord, as the disciples out on the sea failed to this time. We pray you will bless us and work in our lives. If someone's here not saved, never took the hand that was reaching down to them, I pray that today, this moment, this hour, before this meeting is over, take the hand of the Lord Jesus and, and ask him to forgive their sins and save their soul. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Even when we falter, you love us and you're there for us. And we are so grateful for you above all things today to be thankful for. We're thankful for what you have done and for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.